welcome back to Franklin Covey's On Leadership with Scott Miller podcast. I'm privileged to serve as your host and interviewer each week where, honestly, each week we keep outdoing ourselves, delighted to know that the guest lists that keep uh, building are resonating and changing the way you lead your organizations, your teams, your families, and your own life. This week we have the Phenom author, Morgan Housel, who wrote the book, The Psychology of Money. This book is a masterpiece. Who isn't reading it? I don't know. The tagline is Timeless Lessons on Wealth, Greed, and Happiness. Morgan, where were you 30 years ago when I was an impressionable young person obsessed with my public image? I was uh, in, in third grade or something like that. I'm sorry I wasn't Ooh, there ouch, to help that you. Hurt. But, but, that hurt. But, but I am happy to be here now, and I'm so impressed with the book wall behind you, and I'm excited well, to hopefully be added to uh, it. In fact, we have read all of them and interviewed most of them, and so honestly, we are honored that you took the time today to join us and talk about, in fact, the psychology of money. Before we get into the horrifyingly, piercingly accurate insights you share in the book about our relationship with money, Morgan, rewind, go back a couple of decades. Um, what were you doing early on? What was your journey now to becoming literally a household name and probably the leading author when it comes to understanding our relationship with money? Well, I've, I've always been a financial writer for my entire career. I started as a full-time writer when I was a junior in college for The Motley Fool, and that was in 2008, and the world was blowing up at the time. So the world was imploding, and I started my career as a writer. I never intended to be a writer. I wanted to be an investment banker or a hedge fund manager, um, but nobody was hiring in 2008. And I stumbled across a job as a writer at The Motley Fool. I thought I would do that for six months or something before I found a job as a hedge fund manager, but I ended up loving it. I, I, I never intended to do it, but I ended up falling in love with the process of trying to observe what's going on in the world and how people think about their money and make decisions with their money, trying to glean a couple of insights from that and then tell a story about it from there. And that's what I've done for my entire career. And it's all I will ever do. So I, I, I really enjoy doing this. I'm not, a, I'm not a, a, a fund manager. I'm not a financial advisor. I'm not a journalist either. I just, I just try to figure out what people are thinking and what I am thinking. And then how can I tell a, tell a story about that rather than just regurgitating a formula like so much finance is? Morgan, we've talked with all the greats. Um, Robert Kiyosaki, Dave Ramsey, Susie Orman, Gene Chatsky, Chris Hogan, Tiffany Alice. I mean, if someone's written a seminal book on personal finance, we've interviewed them, have talked with them, or have met them. Your book is a little bit different. Your approach is really understanding kind of the why, right? What are the deep-seated paradigms, mindsets, beliefs that were inculcated in us about money? Today, we're going to talk all about the beliefs of money and the psychology of money. But I think the most horrifying statement in your entire book which is also the most piercingly insightful, is the following. Now, now, for those listeners and viewers, you need to buckle up because this is going to be basically like an eagle enema for you because it certainly was for me. Spending money to show people how much money you have is the fastest way to have less money. Unpack that it's for us. It's a good us. one, right? You know, I, I first have to say there are a couple quotes in the book. I think that might be one of them that my wife wants to remind you that I think she came up with. That, that might be one of them. I, 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 I don't recall if that's exactly one of them, but I, I feel like I have to disclose that from the beginning. A lot of this stuff comes from her. She's often the master of this stuff. But I think it's, it's really true. It, it, I, I think it hits people like a ton of bricks, like it maybe did for you, because it's obviously true that so much modern spending in the United States and around the world above some basic level of sustenance is, is spending money to show people how much money you have. The house that you live in, the car that you drive, the clothes that you wear, even like the restaurants that you eat, that you eat at, a lot of the stuff is just to show people that you've made it. Now, let me make a really important point, which is that a lot of that, or at least some of that, is fine and great, and I do it, and I will continue to do it. There is no shame in wanting to send a signal socially to other people that you belong to this tribe, that you have this kind of taste, that you like this and that. There's nothing wrong with that. But I think once you see the game that is played and how far people take it, you realize that it's just a game. And to me, maybe the biggest insight from this that has like a practical takeaway is that nobody is thinking about you as much as you are. And whenever you spend money on the nice clothes or the nice car or the nice house with the intention of sending a signal to other people, it is so easy, so easy to underestimate or excuse me, to overestimate how much social benefit you are going to get from that. And whenever someone has a nice thing that they're showing off, 
the other people who are looking at them are not looking at you and saying, wow, I really like Morgan's house. I really like Scott's clothes, whatever it might be. They are imagining themselves in that nice house, wearing those nice clothes and imagining all of the compliments that they would be getting for themselves. Everyone just transposes their own ego onto your showing off in a way that is a really, it's a game that nobody can win. And once you realize it's a game, I think it becomes easier to take a step back and say, okay, how then can I actually use my money to make myself happier rather than playing that stupid ego game? Okay, whoa, 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 whoa. Are you suggesting for a moment that people aren't thinking as much about Scott Miller as Scott Miller is thinking about? I can't deliver with a straight face, of course not. Let's talk about the psychology of money and our relationship with money. I think it was 30 years ago I heard Susie Orman talk about you know, you can tell how you value money based on how the money is in your wallet, back when we had money in our wallet. And she talked about how one of the signs of people that have a good, healthy relationship with money is how you can open up your wallet and see, is it all crumpled up? Is it every which way? Or are all the bills kind of lined up? And it kind of got my, um, it got my juices flowing, probably a little bit of um, obsessive compulsive disorder. I started ironing all my money in my teens. Literally, I, would, I was a waiter. I would take my money out for my tips and I would iron it all and put it in my wallet and kind of take it out very carefully. That might be a bit extreme. I taught it to my three sons. They love to iron their money amongst ironing other things. Talk about the psychology behind our relationship with our money. Let's talk about where our paradigms start back with how we're raised and how it infiltrates our relationship with money as adults. Well, first, I think there was a Simpsons episode where Ned Flanders used to organize his dollar bills by serial number. But ironing it is, is even more, is more extreme than that. Thanks so you a have lot. Ned Thanks Flanders a lot. Appreciate that. In this, in, in, in this category. I think, I mean, the, the first point is that everyone, including myself, every single person is a prisoner to their past. And particularly the experiences financially and economically that they grew up with in their teens and their early 20s when they are really starting to learn about how the real world works and they're very young and impressionable. So what you happen to experience in your teens and 20s sticks with you for life. And this is really important because a lot of what you experience is determined by where and when you were born, the generation in the country that you were born into, and also, of course, the values that were instilled in you by your parents and your teachers, all of which is completely out of your control. So of course, if you grew up during the Great Depression, you have a very different view of money and debt and investing than somebody who grew up in the 1990s. And, and there are infinite number of possibilities that you can have from there. So when you realize that everyone has experienced a tiny little infinitesimal fraction of the world is what they've experienced, but that experience sets their mindset for how they think the world works and the lens in which they view the world, you realize that we all have completely different views of money and how it works and what it can and can't do for you and what our risk tolerances are and what we worry about is all completely different, which throws a lot of people off because in most fields, there is one right answer. If we're talking about meteorology, the weather or biology or chemistry, there's one right answer. And in math, two plus two equals four, no matter who you are or where you're from, there's one right answer. But with money, there are a billion different quote unquote right answers because people who have different experiences have different risk tolerances, different aspirations. I wrote this book through the lens of myself and my own life, which has been, been influenced by what I experienced as a child, as a teenager, et cetera. So I have, I, I'm not making any claims that what I say is 100% right. It's just my observations. But I love when I get feedback from readers in India and in Australia and in Italy and in Italy, in Singapore who are like, hey, in my culture, here's how we think about it. And it's very different from yours in a way that I never would have thought about. So we're all definitely prisoners to our past. I definitely think the two big mindsets that occur and are, and are determined from those pasts tends to be people who use money as a tool to better their lives versus people who become slaves to their money and, 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 and their money kind of dictates their own life. The irony about this is that a lot of people who are slaves to money are the richest people. It's not intuitive at all that that would be the case, but a lot of people who are completely controlled and handcuffed by money are the richest people. I'll, I'll give you, the, to, to me, what I think is the best example of this that has ever existed, and is the Vanderbilt family. The heirs of Cornelius Vanderbilt, who at one point in the 1800s was worth something like $400 billion adjusted for inflation. And unlike a lot of the other robber barons, the Carnegies and the Morgans and the Rockefellers who donated most of their money, 
the 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 Vanderbilt's basically put four hundred billion dollars in a big pile and told their heirs to have a blast with it. Is basically what they did, and so there's three generations of Vanderbilt heirs who had more money than they could possibly know what to do with. And if you read their biography, there's a very good book called Fortune's Children, written about the Vanderbilt heirs. Every single one of them, without exception, was miserable. Every single one of them was depressed, had no purpose in the world, was taken advantage of. Without exception, they're miserable. And I think you go through it and you realize that they were slaves to money. Their entire purpose in the world was being defined by how much money they had and how they could spend it. And that was just a perfect example of someone who was a slave to money versus someone else who uses money to gain independence and control and autonomy and pursuing what they want, when they want, with whom they want for as long as they want to do it. Those are the two big mindsets that I think are heavily determined by our experiences in life. Morgan, I found it tacky earlier when you were flaunting all of the foreign languages in which your book is translated. And of course, when I say tacky, I mean I was envious and admirable. The book really is a masterpiece. It's, there's a reason why it has been translated into how many languages, sir? Uh, 52 now. Congratulations. I mean, literally, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, right? The seminal book upon which our firm is partially based, but written by Stephen Covey, been out for 30 years, is, I think, in 56 languages. Your book has been in publication how long? Two years. I mean, this is like, this is not to be lost on the viewers and listeners. In two years, this book, The Psychology of Money, has been translated into 52 languages. It's almost without parallel. You've got to read this book. It will be transformative for all of you listening and watching today. Morgan, I want to water ski across a couple of concepts in the next 15 minutes, and let's maybe take a minute or two and dive into each of these. Um, You have a concept you called getting wealthy versus staying wealthy. There's only one way to stay wealthy. It's some combination of frugality and paranoia. Riff on that. Well, the the big contrast here is that the difference between getting rich and staying rich or getting wealthy and staying wealthy, which are two not only different but contrasting skills. And very few people have both of them at the same time. There are a fair number of people who are good at getting rich and some people who are good at keeping their money, very few who have both of them at the same time because the skills conflict. Getting rich requires being an optimist and taking a risk, swinging for the fences, being optimistic about your own abilities, other people's abilities. That's what you need to get rich. Staying rich is like almost the exact opposite. It requires a sense of paranoia and conservative, conservatism, being scared about the short term and all of the risks that are in the news, having a high savings rate, avoiding debt, having lots of cash in the bank. That's what you need to stay rich. And to pair that with the optimistic mindset is is tough because most people want to view optimism and pessimism as black or white. You are either optimist or you're a pessimist and you're you're one of those two. But the people who do, do very well over time get optimism and pessimism to coexist with themselves. One way that I've thought about this that I think is really helpful to wrap this up is saving your money like a pessimist and investing your money like an optimist. That's the way to do it. Save your money like the world is going to come to an end in the next year, but invest your money with the idea that if you can endure all those risks, the the rewards for long-term investors can be extraordinary. In fact, in the book, you also talk about how, you know, there are certain things you can control and things you can't control. And there are some similarities to people who recognize that. And in some ways it's both uh, kind of uh, uh, empowering to understand change happens and there's things that you can't control. Talk a little bit about what successful people do with money as it relates to kind of embracing change and understanding there are outside influences and how you prepare for those. One, One big idea here is recognizing that luck and risk are basically the exact same thing, just in opposite directions. The definition of luck is that there are things that can happen to you that are outside of your control, that have a major impact on your outcomes. That's what luck is. That's also the exact definition of what risk is. It's just risk goes in the other direction. What's important here is that we spend so much time in our finances talking about risk, economic risk, investing risk, business risk, career risk, and we're almost completely blind and we never wanna talk about luck, even though it's the same thing, it's just as powerful. The reason is because if I were to say, Scott, you just got lucky in life, I sound like a jerk. So I'm not going to say that. And it's not true, by the way. I know you're a very hard, hardworking guy. And, but, and, and if I were to look myself in the mirror and say, Morgan, you got lucky, I don't want to admit that either. That makes, that makes me feel bad. So we are like systematically ignorant of luck, even though it has played such a key role in outcomes. And I think when you realize how important luck is and how much it is ignored, we are so taken aback and so surprised 
by a lot of times in life when our luck runs out and there is a reversion to the mean and a successful business fails, a successful career implodes, a successful stock declines a lot. We're often shocked by this, even if we are, even if it's, it's par for the course in how the world works. So I think that that's a big part of this is just underestimating how much of a role luck plays in life and how easy it is to ignore that role. Morgan, I've been a privilege to be an associate in the Franklin Covey Company for 27 years. 25 years as a full-time leader and even executive officer, retired two years ago and now consult with the firm and do some ambassador work, including hosting this podcast. About 15 years ago, I was a general manager, one of about six running large businesses in the US, our consulting and training business. I was in Chicago running a large business and we had offices in Atlanta, DC, uh, uh, New York, LA, and Dallas. Well, there was a consolidation and we eliminated the Dallas office and it folded into the Chicago office. And my peer, who was in Dallas, lost his job overnight. Was treated fairly as you would expect at Franklin Covey and had a severance and some career coaching. Very competent person, but he lost a, you know, a well-paid mid to high six-figure sales leader job overnight. Stuff happens. And I called him up the next morning and I was so surprised and envious of his sense of calm. Like I would have been absolutely panicked. And I was single. I'm now married and have three kids. Even then I would have been absolutely panicked. Like, oh my gosh, how am I going to meet my multiple impressive car payments next month? And all those things. And he basically had a great sense of um, calm. He said, yeah, I mean, I've lived beneath my means for 15 years. And even though my wife is a school teacher, we have close to a million dollars in our 401k. By the way, he was 40 years old. And he said, I'm going to be fine. Yes, I'm anxious and it might be hard, but the, the, the sense of calm that was in his voice, he was not an arrogant person. He wasn't an especially calm person in life. He just, he lived the principle of what you teach in the book about freedom and understanding how freedom is so connected to your financial decisions. He had and has a level of freedom psychologically, financially, I can't even relate to. Remind all of our listeners and viewers the connection between freedom and your behaviors. Well, here's what's important. Without knowing that gentleman that you just spoke of, without knowing anything about him, I would bet a lot of money that the stress and anxiety that he avoided by having his liquid savings when he got laid off is 10 times more important to his happiness than any joy he would, have get, he, he would have gotten by spending a lot of that money on nicer stuff, nicer vacations, nicer cars, whatever it might be. That is so easy to overlook. And it is so natural First to First of all, view. that's insulting. It's piercingly true, but it's very insulting. But keep going, sir. <laughs> it's, 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 so, it's so easy to overlook. And it's so easy to view the penny-pinching miser, if you want to phrase it like that, as, as someone to look down upon that they're not living life. They don't know to have fun. And sometimes that is true, full stop. There are people who are like that, that just don't have a good relationship with money, don't know how to spend it to have a good time. It's so easy to overlook though, that if you take the, 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 the really bad things that happen in people's lives, divorce, job loss, medical emergency, losing a loved one, whatever it might be, the odds that one, at least one of those will happen to everybody, me, you, everybody, over the course of our life are 100%. 100%, one if not all of those are gonna hit people. But, it, but nobody wants to admit that. Nobody wants to talk about that. And when one of those things hits, your independence, your ability to just wake up and do what you want, when you want, with whom you want, on your own terms, on your own time horizon, is, is going to be like as important as oxygen to you at that point. One of the most stressful things that you can have in your life is to lose your job or have a medical emergency or whatever it might be and have, be so strained financially that during that moment, you are completely beholden to somebody else's goals and priorities, whether that's your boss or you're, you're frantically having to take the next job that you can take, even if it's a terrible job and with a long commute, whatever it might be. That sense of independence that you can gain from having savings, that return, that the ROI that you get on that does not show up in a brokerage statement. There's no interest rate that you're earning on it. But when, once you cash that in, that independence as that guy that you, just, that you just mentioned did, you realize that the return that you get from independence can be 10 times higher then you can earn from any great investment. But, it's, it's, but since that return is not on a price tag, it's not on a brokerage statement, it's so overlooked until you cash it in, you realize it's the most important thing in the world to you. 
Can you imagine how much calm my life would possess had you and I been neighbors growing up? I mean, the influence you, you, you could have had on me. <laughs> you, would have, you would have looked down upon me. I'm, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> Most, well, here's, no, this is actually a really, a really important point that I want to make. The ability to spend money to show people that you have money and to show people your nice clothes and your nice car might be very, very important when you are young and looking for a potential mate, potential spouse. Then it's really important to put your peacock feathers up and do it. It maybe gains less importance as you become more established in your career, in your relationships, in your marriage, whatever it might be. That becomes less one, important. One would hope, but keep going. <laughs> but that's, that's you know, when, when, whenever I talk about spending money to show people how much money you have is the fast way to have less money, that's, that, 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 that might be a very important philosophy when you are at one point in your life. But if you're 22 and trying to sh find your position in the world, Maybe it's less important. And when you're 22, buying the nicer clothes and having the nicer car might have more importance to you. It might be a better idea than when you're 38 and have three kids. Morgan, let's, let's explore that. You're not a psychiatrist, as last time I checked, nor are you a psychologist, nor are you a mental health counselor, but you're certainly a researcher of human behavior in our relationship, the psychology of money. Uh, cut to the chase. Why are so many of us still doing just that? buying cars, homes, entertaining, clothes, purses, wallets, rings, watches. Why are so many, especially in the Western Hemisphere, why are we so obsessed with what Dr. Covey would have called the social mirror? Is it, is it we just have a vacuous sense of self-esteem or self-confidence? We're so caught up in all that's going on around us. We feel so um, needed to be liked and adored by others. Because you write in your book, I mean, arguably some of the most influential, secure people in the world, you can't see their money. Their money is hidden. The true wealth is not what you see, it's what you don't see. What have you learned from your decades researching this? Why is someone like me, Scott Miller, very successful career, finally my credit score has eclipsed my SAT score. I'm not kidding, do the math. Why is someone like me still in that rat race? Other than I'm I think soulless, which I'm not. <laughs> Completely. You know, obviously, there's there's a spectrum, but everybody has some sense of insecurity. Obviously, there's a there's a very deep spectrum there, but I think that's a lot of this. Why are we so primed to want to spend and get ahead? Uh, I, I think at our core, a lot of people don't really feel great about themselves, and they have this idea that if if they could only get the bigger house, if they could only get the nicer car, then all of their problems would go away. There's this really great great quote that I read from Will Smith recently in Will Smith's biography. He said, when he was poor and depressed, he could tell himself that if only he had more money, all of his problems would go away, and that gave him a sense of hope. But then when he was rich and depressed, that sense of hope went away. Because he, because he could no longer say, if only I had more money, all my problems would go away. He had, all, he had more money than he could spend, and he was as depressed as he ever was. But I think for most of us who are, don't have that kind of level of money yet, it is so easy to have this connection of, if only my net worth was X, then things would be easier. Then things would go better. But our ability to move the goalpost perpetually, there's no end to how far you can move the goalpost, goes on forever. And it is such a powerful thing that to say, if, my, if only my net worth were X, it'd be better. And then you get to X and it's like, oh, well, maybe I need 2X. Maybe I need 3X. Maybe I need 4X. That never changes. For sure, there are professional baseball players who make $5 million a year who feel like they are not doing very well in the world because they have teammates who make $20 million a year. And there, there are baseball players who make $50 million a year who might not feel like they're doing that well because there are hedge fund managers who make a billion dollars a year. Like that game never ever ends. And since everyone measures their well-being relative to those around them, and even if you are a billionaire, but you're surrounded by decabillionaires, you don't feel like you're doing very well. Like there's no end to that. It's always going to be the case that no matter how rich and successful society becomes, we're going to feel like we're falling a little bit behind relative to others who are doing a little bit better than us. That's not a good thing. We should fight back against that to the extent that we can, but that's why this happens. I used to have a leader at Franklin Covey that used to say it's just a higher level of poverty. Um, my wife and I have a fairly affluent friend group, of which we're usually the least affluent in the group. And of course it wears on your self-esteem and self-confidence, we're humans. But we also have friends that are less affluent and when they're in our lifestyle, you can see how it wears on them as well too. I also had a colleague that once said that you'll never have enough until you've defined how much is enough. And that was, um, I think, haunting for me. 
let me pivot for a moment. I believe it was Dave Ramsey that said something loosely quoted and outrageous like the following. He said, a paycheck is merely what a company gives you to give up on your dreams. Loosely quoted. You talk a lot in the book about time compounding. Do you find that the people who have the best relationship with money, including who have the most money, that they do something different than entrepreneurs do or people with side hustles? Are there some commonalities that all of us, if we could just kind of like get our lives centered, get our values aligned to our needs and separately our wants, what are the things that people who build wealth that leverage time and compounding do that those of us who don't could learn? And maybe is it, is it, is it ever too late to start? First, I would say, I think there's actually a very large chunk of society that has no aspiration to be an entrepreneur. They have no aspiration for a side hustle. And so when people say like, oh, they're, they're giving up on their dreams by being a salaried worker, I, just, I just think that's just, that's just assuming that what Dave Ramsey and other people want is what everyone else wants, which is, which is not the case. If, if there is a common trait for people that I think tend to be happiest with their money, regardless of what their net worth is, it's low expectations. It's the people who have the lowest expectations who wake up astounded that, wow, I have a thousand dollars in the bank, but I, I never expected that I would have that. So I feel amazing about that. I have a friend, a uh, good friend of mine who grew up in abject poverty in Africa, and now he works in tech in California. And he, to this day, even though he has a very good high paying career today, till this day, he says every time a hot meal is placed in front of him, he's astounded and his eyes bug up and he just says, wow, like he's so grateful for it because of what the expectations that were instilled in him when he was a child. That I think I, I'm kind of envious of that, that he takes so much pleasure out of something that I don't think anything about. And I think that the takeaway from that is like, if you really want to be happy in life with anything, with your money or anything else, it's not your circumstances that necessarily make a difference. It's your expectations. And if your expectations grow faster than your income, you will never be happy with your money, no matter how wealthy you are. And wealth is always a two-part equation. You need to grow your income, grow your net worth. That's what we focus all of our attention on. But then the second part of the equation is you need to keep that money in check relative to your expectations. And it is so easy to let those expectations run wild or to ignore that that's even part of the equation. And that's why there are so many people, whether they are poor or rich or decabillionaires, doesn't matter, who even who despite their circumstances, despite their wealth, are never happy and never satisfied with what they have. Morgan, like you, I'm an author, and I write a series of books for HarperCollins called Master Mentors. 10, 10 books in 10 years, where each year I write a book about 30 guests that I interviewed and I shared insight about each of them with their permission. I was on a podcast this morning as a guest being interviewed about this book. And one of the interviewees, actually it was a radio program, and asked me, what, what do all these mentors have in common? And I said, well, a couple of things. One is they have what I would call an indefatigable work ethic. Look behind me on this wall and these people work hard, whether it's, you know, John Gray, Mentor from Mars, or Jack Canfield, Chicken Soup, who sold a half billion books. Jack Canfield does not need to sell one more book. Either does John Gray or Tony Robbins or Liz Wiseman. Uh, and then I said, what also they have in common is they weren't overnight successes. There's no such thing, right? You know, overnight success, if it does exist, it's usually ill-gotten or fleeting. No such thing yes. as overnight success is what, you, what Matthew McConaughey and Jay Shetty and others have in common with Susan Cain and... Kim Scott is they toiled for years. They made mistakes. You don't see these mistakes. All you see is sort of the flash in the pan. All of a sudden, they're an overnight success. I think that's bunk. You might be surprised to know how many roles Matthew McConaughey didn't get until he got a time to kill. I want to talk about you for a moment. I, want to, I don't want to say you've burst from the scene. You've already talked about your career. But in the last two years, you wrote a seminal book called The Psychology of Money. And this book has now sold a ridiculous amount of copies. I'm interviewing you here in the podcast because of your influence and your agreement to come on. And it's been translated in already 50 languages or more in two years. What lessons could you teach? Maybe check your humility for a moment. What are some of the replicable lessons that you've dedicated in your own career? Maybe less about money and more about your trajectory to influence that anybody looking to host a podcast, write a column, create an NFT, open up an, an Etsy store, whatever their passion is, whatever they think their pursuit to happiness or stability is, what are some of the lessons that you've employed that anybody else could replicate? I'll tell you one that I think has maybe been the most important to me that I think is that, that other people in other fields might be able to use this for themselves. And it's counterintuitive. 
it's always when you are a writer or when you're a communicator, people say, know your audience and write for your audience. That's, that's always the advice. And to me, I think it's, the, it's exactly the opposite. I, I do what I call selfish writing. Where I write for an audience Amen. of one, which Amen. is me. Amen. I, only, I only write things that I am interested in. And I only write sentences that I look at and say, oh, that's good. I never I, for, once, for one second think about you, the reader. Purely a selfish activity. The reason why I do that is because if I like this, a, I'm going to do my best work because it doesn't feel like I'm working for you. I'm just writing because it's fun for me. And, and then I take a leap of faith that if I like this, maybe other people will too. Not everybody, but somebody else will too. I think, there is, I think the idea of, of know your audience or know your customer very quickly becomes pander to your audience or pander to your customer. And that's dangerous. Whereas it's, if you're doing something because you yourself like it, it tends to be great. And so, some advice that I heard from Brian Chetsky, who's a founder of Airbnb, he said, you don't want a million people who like you. You want 100 people who love you. That's, that's how you really grow an amazing business or write a great book or whatever it might be. So I think flipping that common advice on its head has been really helpful for me. I think it's phenomenal advice. I actually write the same exact way. Seth Godin would love that because he talks about your smallest viable market, not your largest viable market. So extremely well said. I want to end with one final insight. You write about saving money. Quote, Less ego, more wealth. Saving money is the gap between your ego and your income, and wealth is what you don't see. Send all of us with um, large car payments, those beautiful things of status and influence sitting in our driveways. What do you want all of us to be? What do you, what do you want to pound in our heads as we leave today about wealth is what you don't see? Well, let's talk about cars like, like, like you just did. And what runs on cars is, is gas and fuel. What is easier and more feasible to do? To find more sources of gas and oil or to make a car that is more energy efficient? It's so much is, is the latter. It is so much easier to do because it's in our control. Rather than assuming we can go find a new oil field, just make a car that gets better miles per gallon and you get the same effect. Exact same with our money. For most people, what is easier to do? to go out and find another million dollars. Not, not saying that's, in, in, that's impossible, or I'm not saying that you shouldn't try to do that. But for most people, it is so much more in their control to compress their expectations, compress their ego a little bit, recognize that nobody's thinking about your stuff as much as you are. And that's where the savings, the efficiency are gonna be found. There are so many investors who will tie themselves in knots and work 100 hours a week trying to improve their investment re returns by half of 1% when they have like five percentage points of fat in their, in their daily spending that could so easily be cut today and not have any impact on their happiness and it's sitting right there. And so I think that is the biggest room for improvement for most people is not necessarily how can I earn more money, even though that's important, it's how can I suppress my expectations so I get the same effect and it's more in my control. Morgan, what's next for you? You have this um, incomparable book, Psychology of Money. What should everybody watching and listening look for next from you? I'm, I'm writing a, a, a new book right now. It's on similar topics, but it's a, a little bit broader. It'll probably be out next summer. I don't have much else to say about it other than that, but maybe I can come back on your show and we can add another book to the wall sometime next year. Uh, you have a guaranteed spot back on On Leadership. Morgan Housel, the book is Psychology of Money. Thank you so much for your energy, your raw vulnerability and transparency, and the gift that is Psychology of Money. Thanks for your time, sir. Thank you. And we'll see you back here next week for a new conversation on leadership. <laughs>